Welcome to our Living with Beavers webinar. Uh, tonight we have Ariana Winkler, who is our Habitat Restoration Project Coordinator. She does a lot of work with beavers, and so I'm excited to see what she has in store for us. And then my name is Laura Dockenhausen. I'm the Outreach and Events Coordinator. So I put on a lot of these webinars, and I do some workshops and work with the cities and stuff like that. Okay. So uh, we would love for if you guys have questions for you to put them in the Q&A uh, section down here on your Zoom screen. Uh, we'll have chances to ask questions throughout and then we'll also answer some questions at the end. So if you put them in there and you don't hear us ask them right away, we might be saving them up for the end. Um, so you can go right down here and put your question in the Q&A. And then also if you would like to have closed captions on, like live captions, I think that that's something that you turn on yourself because I was trying to see if I could turn it on for everybody, but I don't think that I can, or if I can, I haven't figured out how. So if you see this little circle over here, it says closed caption. If you're interested in turning that on, um, feel free to do that. So yeah, we would love to have your questions. And then I just wanted to talk really quick about what a conservation district is and a little bit about what we do. So we provide a lot of free technical assistance and financial assistance to land managers in the county and also Camino Island. We work with rural and urban residents to improve habitat, soil health, productivity, resiliency, and water quality. Pretty much anything that has to do with natural resources, we can potentially help out with. And uh, we'll help you maybe do some best management practices so that what you're doing is a good balance for the health of your land and the health of like the Puget Sound in general, but also what works for you, what works best for the ecology. So we really try to find that balance. And a lot of our um, services are free to you. So if you're interested, you could check us out um, on our website. And if you're specifically interested in some of our beaver resources, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with this recorded um, webinar but also with some other resources like this webpage here. And there is a lot of stuff on our website, so feel free to check all that out. I'll be sending that email probably tomorrow. So yeah, and then if you're interested in staying in touch with like other events that we have, other webinars that we have, or even um, in-person events, we're doing more in-person events. So for example, we have our Living with Beavers workshop and project site tour on January 20th. So it'll be kind of like an ex expansion of what this is, maybe just like going over some of the same things, but we'll get a chance to go see um, a project site in person. So that'll be at the Lake Stevens Library and there are limited spots. So if you would like to come, make sure to go check out uh, our events calendar. Although I will say it's not on the events calendar yet. So keep an eye on the events calendar, but in the follow-up email, I will send our registration link. So if you're interested in checking that out right away, I'll send a link tomorrow and uh, you can sign up on our Eventbrite, but also just for events in the future, you can keep an eye on our events calendar on our website. So yeah. So yeah, so like I said, this is Ariana. She'll be doing our Beaver workshop tonight. Um, she's our Habitat Restoration Project Coordinator at the district, and she's been working with beavers for around four years. So she has a lot of experience in the field and she's very knowledgeable about kind of like creating the opportunity to live with beavers, to coexist with beavers in a way that is helpful to the beavers, but also to us. And I think um, Ariana is just really passionate about making sure that we can all like live in harmony with the beavers. So I'm really excited to see what she's got. And with that, I'll pass it to Ariana. Yeah, thanks, Laura. I am excited to do this event with you and uh, yeah, check out those other events. We've got good stuff going on. Um, okay. Yeah, so I'm Ariana. Um, I am the Habitat Restoration Coordinator, so I plan a lot of restoration uh, projects, mostly along streams or wetlands, and I coordinate um, the installation of little trees like the ones pictured here. Um, and why I'm relevant to you now is because I uh, run the district's Living with Beavers program and install uh, coexisted strategies, which we all will learn more about later in this presentation. Um, 
I can't do anything, uh, any of that, any of my work without a field crew. So I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to them. There I am working with them um, out in the field. But you're here for Beaver. So what are we going to talk about? We're gonna talk about who they are, um, what they're doing out there, why you should care, and then how the district, and then also maybe you uh, fit into all of that. Before we um, dive into that, I'd love to take a poll. Um, has anyone ever seen a beaver? If you have, uh, where? And um, yeah, we'll talk about some doppelgangers here in a second. So we'll, we'll really see um, why, if, if you've actually seen a beaver or not. Um, and then we also have the second question, why are you interested in this talk? Just so I can kind of um, focus in on the specific reasons and be helpful. When should we end the poll war? Um, we can, we've got, how many answers do we have? Oh yeah, we have like, I think 14 answers, 15 of 19. Oh, okay, I see. We can end it like, oh, it says 89% participated. So yeah, that's like. Oh, yeah. Do you think, uh, I can't see the answers to number two. Okay. You know, me either. I have never done a short answer one, so I'll see. Maybe when I end it, we can see it. But um, okay. if you didn't get a chance to answer, you can answer in the chat as well. So I'm going to end the poll, but feel free to put your answers in the chat. Yeah, it looks like uh, a good amount of you have seen a beaver while um, out and about recreating. A good uh, About a third of you haven't seen a beaver, so I'm excited to share more about them. And then it's pretty cool that about a quarter of you have seen them near your property, uh, which will be, you know, just want to point out the district can be of good help there. Ariana, I have the short answers here. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe I could just read some to you really quick. Yeah, that'd be great. So some of you, why are you tuning in tonight? I want to have inviting habitat, if possible, on my property. I work for local government and we have many beaver conflicts. I'm here to learn. Uh, beavers have flooded my land. I have a beaver in Star Creek that crosses our property. I'm a student in sustainability practices program at Cascadia. Ooh, Cascadia mm -hmm. alumni, let's go. And I'm interested in everything to do with my county. Nice. And one, and this one says, I want to learn more about beavers. Uh, there's a bunch more answers, but that's just some of them. So thank you guys for answering that. And we're excited you're here. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yes, we'll cover all of those topics. So um, thanks for letting me know what you're interested in. Um, yeah, so we're here to talk about beavers. Um, they live all throughout North America. Um, there's also a European beaver that is a separate species. Um, wherever there is water and woody vegetation, you'll probably find a beaver. They're very ad adaptive and um, resilient. So there's urban beavers, there's rural beavers. There's, um, yeah, they are there to create their own habitat. Um, so as long as they have the means to do that, they probably will eventually get there. Um, as I talked about, there are some doppelgangers. So beavers um, that you may, you may see something swimming in your stream and um, you may think it's a beaver, but it might not be. So beavers are probably the biggest of the, it's actually our biggest rodent here in North America. Um, they're going to be up to 70 pounds, so I like to think of them almost as a dog or like a medium small dog, um, but they're just a lot more rounder and a little maybe even cuter. I don't know. Um, and then um, the other one that people see a lot are these nutria. Um, they're they're smaller, but they have those same orange teeth and similar um, they're rodents, so they look a little similar and they also like swimming around uh, in ponds and streams. Um, but the key thing to look at is that it is smaller and it has a rat tail as opposed, like a long skinny tail, as opposed to that 
flat leathery paddle tail. Um, so that's an important distinct distinguishing factor. Um, we also have muskrats with which also you know swim around and look or swimming around rodents uh, that can look similar. I've mistaken a muskrat for a baby beaver before, so everyone does it. Um, again, they have that long skinny tail and they're really small. They're only up to five pounds. Um, we also have river otters. Um, they don't look quite the same. They don't have teeth or that kind of face shape, but um, they do swim around a lot in beaver ponds and rivers. Um, I can tell these apart usually because of uh, the way they move. I would say river otters are a little more agile and can um, maybe climb up somewhere a little easier and move a little faster. Um, and then we also have a mountain beaver. These are not in ponds or streams, um, but people get confused and reach out to me sometimes and say, hey, I have a beaver eating my trees up in a, you know, up in my uplands. And um, actually it's a, probably a mountain beaver. Um, they're really small um, and they are not related to beavers at all, but sometimes they do get blamed for, uh, beavers do get blamed for mountain beaver activity. So those are just some doppelgangers to look out for. Um, yeah, I encourage you all to look for beavers uh, wherever you can. Um, if you want to see a beaver, you should go at dawn or dusk as they are nocturnal. Um, beavers are what we call choosy generalists. So they are herbivores. They do not eat fish uh, um, that reside in their pond. They instead look at those trees along their shorelines. Um, they love um, they love willow, specifically in our area, and other deciduous um, trees and shrubs. They eat the cambium layer of uh, woody vegetation, which is that layer right underneath the bark. So um, a common sign of a beaver is just that um, chewed wood uh, denuded of any bark. They also will eat herbaceous vegetation. Um, and um, so, you know, during the winter, they'll re really rely on that woody vegetation. And in the summertime, they'll throw in some other herbaceous vegetation. Um, we call them choosy generalists because if there's willows around, they'll eat a willow. But if there's no willows around, they'll really eat any woody, woody material. Um, so unfortunately, it's not as simple to say, hey, if I don't want the beaver eating my plants, I'll just plant something else. Um, they kind of will eat anything if uh, they have to. So these are some uh, pictures of their chew. Um, you know, people sometimes don't know what chew down their tree or they, they will blame a beaver when really someone else cut down their tree but um, you can see their teeth marks in um, the wood um, and you can see the freshly chewed um, debris that they've chewed down. Um, this one picture is of uh, three trees in different stages of them chewing it. So it, it doesn't happen you know, immediately. Sometimes they'll take many days to chew down a tree. Normally I would uh, pass around some chew sticks so you can all see them up close. Um, and I'd also pass around a beaver skull, but um, here we're just gonna show it on this great presentation. Um, beavers can do this. They can chew down this really hard woody material and chew down your trees um, because they have these teeth. Uh, they have um, two, four teeth up front that are plated in iron. So um, the tooth is very strong. Um, as you can see it in that bottom picture, um, it's only plated in the front with iron and um, the back is just normal enamel. So it will wear down itself um, as they chew and become very sharp. Um, so they have no problem cutting down many trees at a time, which is pretty cool. Um, and they chew trees down uh, for, for their diet, like we just talked about, um, but they also chew it down for material building materials. Um, so the main thing they use it for um, is dams. Um, there's many different shapes, shapes, forms, styles of dams. Um, they all kind of have, um, they all can be made up of different things. So definitely woody material is gonna be in there, but they also use mud, rocks, uh, vegetation. I've seen a lot of grass in there. Um, really anything they can get their hands on. Um, 
And the dam is to uh, pond water back and create um, these really complex, crazy uh, beaver ponds. And um, they do that because they're aquatic animals. They really feel comfortable in water because they are, they have webbed feet. They have um, eyes and mouth that are kind of um, aligned so that they can float on the water surface and swim around. Um, they are kind of awkward on land. If you've ever seen one on land, um, they move awkwardly and uh, don't prefer to be there. Um, so that is the main reason why they create these dams is to create a large wetted environment in which they can move around, get more food and live. Um, they do not live in the dams. They actually live in um, lodges. The lodges um, can be pretty large and they're either in the middle of the pond or on the edge of the pond. So they're always gonna be in a, in a ponded wet environment. Um, and that is because, like I said, they, they prefer being in water, they feel safest in water. So um, these lodges have underwater entrances. As you can see in this picture, um, it's like a dome and then it has one or multiple underwater entrances that they will swim under and have a dry eating and nesting chamber. Um, similarly, if it's a den, uh, if they don't have a lodge, they'll, they'll burrow a den in the side of the um, in the side of the, sorry, <laughs> the side of the bank um, and um, have a similar chamber there. Uh, this way that they, they can eat and sleep without the fear of predators getting to them because their predators are not able to swim under that underwater entrance and pop up above. Um, it's just great shelter and protection. Beavers are in family groups. So you saw that nesting chamber um, typically, there are um, two, two, a mated individual pair that will have a lodge or a, a complex of dams. And then uh, every year they will have kits. And then um, those kits will stay with them for two years. And then at two years, they will uh, try to find somewhere else to go. Um, so the beavers are actually territorial. They will not be super territorial towards their, their uh, relatives, but they do not want their any beavers living within about one kilometer of their lodge. Um, if you've ever seen a beaver slap its tail, um, that is likely a kind of a warning to say, hey, uh, this is my this is my pond, please get out. <laughs> um, yeah, that is kind of the main key things I wanted to talk about beavers uh, and their kind of like life history and biology. Um, are there any questions before we move on to what benefits they bring? We don't have any questions in the Q&A yet. Um, cool. Yeah, but feel free if you guys have questions to pop them in there. Also, I had the chat disabled by accident, um, but it should be working now. So if you have questions, you can also put them in there. Um, but when you chat, only the only the hosts can see it, not everyone, but we can answer the question for everyone. So yeah, send us your questions. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, so next I wanted to talk about beaver benefits. Um, these are all kind of related to what we just talked about. Um, so if you have any if you have any questions pop up, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or Q and A. Um, yeah, so beaver benefits. Really, the benefit of beavers is that they do create those dams in ponded areas. Um, they can take a stream like this, which is kind of straight and not really interacting with its floodplain, um, and turn it into something like this, which is really complex. They're creating this complex habitat by adding all these different dams. Um, and they are, we call them ecosystem engineers because they do this. They, they engineer their own um, own habitat, uh, which is really quite unique in the animal can, kingdom and something that me as a restoration practitioner and someone who cares about conservation um, is really cool and something we want to try to utilize as much as possible. So as an ecosystem engineer, by building that dam and creating homes for themselves at that pond, um, they increase aquatic habitat they change the habitat and plant communities around them by flooding and inundating more soil. Um, 
some plants can't handle this increased wetness, which is okay because um, birds like the birds um, like the pileated woodpecker use these dead standing wood as habitat for to collect insects um, and food, and then also nest in occasionally. Um, the ponds are great habitat for many uh, different waterfowl and insects. That increased surface area and wetted area is really important for those type of species. Um, amphibians also benefit from these uh, beaver ponds. Um, they specifically they need um, pond edges to breed in and have their eggs develop, and then also obviously they benefit from um, insects and um, that are around those wetlands and also just more wooded environment. Um, and then um, like if it, like all these other things we've mentioned, fish, otters, um, and other predators or waterfowl also benefit from increased uh, water storage and beaver ponds. Um, they're able to find more food and more refugee refuge as uh, they are living. Um, wetlands are also a really important breeding area for a lot of different um, bird species. Um, so really, the first benefit of beavers and their, their engineering is that they build aquatic habitat. They have snags, fallen wood, just more wetted area, more places for animals to live and interact, and more food for those animals. Um, I just said that beavers benefit, uh, beavers benefit fish. Um, juvenile salmon love to hang out in beaver ponds, um, as, as well as some of the other benefits we're gonna cover. But a lot of people are scared about beaver, beaver jams because they are, you know, they seem to be a barrier in that stream. Fish have to jump up them in order to move upstream. Um, salmon, you know, need to do that to continue their life cycle. So um, some people do get scared that beavers cause fish passage barriers. Um, but this isn't actually true. Um, I, you know, beavers and salmon have co-evolved for a long time, ever since both of them have been evolving. Um, and typically salmon are moving upstream where they have to jump over beaver dams when they're large, um, they're getting ready to spawn. Um, and then they're moving downstream when they're small. Um, and a lot of times um, they're moving downstream when water levels are, are when precipitation is high. So a lot of times, like in this picture, water will just be overflowing uh, the dam anyway, or there will be weird side channels around the dam. Um, so salmon find a way to get around these, these dams. Again, they've co-evolved. Um, so I am not too concerned about fish passage when it comes to natural beaver dams. Um, in addition to uh, that building that aquatic habitat, they also improve water quantity. Um, so they um, improve water storage, flood storage. They hold on to that water. Um, when a flood happens, they'll, you know, that the beaver dam will probably not, or the beaver pond will probably not be at capacity. So we'll hold back a lot of that flood water or um, high precipitation water. And then um, water will only pass over it once that, that dam or pond is at capacity. Um, when that happens, um, beaver, beaver ponds, while holding onto that water, they will recharge the groundwater. Kind of the entire weight of all that water and um, just the fact that it's sitting there um, forces water down into the hyperbeic zone. And then that actually will pop up later in the stream downstream um, and uh, become cleaner, cooler water um, and uh, improve water quantity even during um, even during the summer months when now we're experiencing more and more drought. Um, additionally, beaver dams are very impressive, but they're not 100%, um, you know, they're not watertight. They are porous. So over the summer months, some of that stored water will trickle through the dam and provide water quantity when a stream may run dry. 
um, they improve water qual quantity, but they also improve water quality by um, beavers or by the by the water um, slowing down and uh, creating a ponded pool. Um, a lot of sediment will uh, drop out of the water column. Um, this also filters out pollutants that may be sitting in there. Um, the water has more time to to settle, but also interact with the uh, microbes and everything in the hyperreic zone. Um, so um, nitrogen and phosphorus levels, kind of all water quality is better um, downstream of the dam. And that is because the dam, the pond itself filters it and then the groundwater also uh, benefits downstream by popping up later. Um, that is a, a one reason why fish really benefit from beaver ponds is because they clean the water and then they also create that really big ponded area where juvenile fish can hang out and um, be happy and get some insects and have some space to chill out for a sec. Um, additionally, um, beaver dams hold back a lot of sediment. Um, and then downstream of that, um, there's more gravel, which salmon need for um, spawning. So it's kind of a whole part of the system. Beavers are doing a lot of things for water, but also for salmon. So just to summarize, um, beavers build aquatic habitat. They increase that aquatic habitat that is needed by many species. They improve water quality, um, which is really important for salmon and also us as we drink and use the water to recreate and whatever else. Um, and then they also improve water quant quantity, which is really important during those summer droughts. Um, and uh, yeah, all this means um, that there is better ecosystem resilience, which is something really important as we um, look at climate change and face climate change um, as it continues to develop. So typically, this is kind of a normal historic stream flow. You know, it gets higher in the winter, um, lower in the summer, um, and has a kind of normal pattern to it. Um, climate change just really increases this. So the wet gets wetter, dry gets drier. Um, we're seeing more droughts. Um, so um, yeah, that, that graph is kind of just shifted. Um, but if you add beavers to that, Again, they attenuate floods, so they hold back flood water in their ponds, um, and then they store water for summer months by uh, releasing water through their dams and then also recharging that groundwater. Um, so we kind of trend back to that normal um, without with less extremes, and that all leads to better resilience um, for our communities. Um, also, a cool thing that is kind of a uh, new science or you know the new research has been coming out about this is that beavers are really important for wildfire well that says wildlife but it's supposed to be wildfire um resilience um they because they they increase the wetted area and store that water and help the plant community around them um they create buffers um and are impacted less by wildfires. So they're kind of a refuge during that wildfire for the plants and you know water, but also for any wildlife that needs to um, survive during that wildfire. Um, and then they also, um, beaver dam areas, communities, uh, recover quicker from those wildfires. So even if they are impacted, there's more water available. Um, there's a more complex system there. Um, so they are able to recover from that wildfire a little quicker. All that is to say beavers have a huge impact on the ecosystem. Um, they uh, are our restoration partners is what we like to call them. So we a lot of a lot of times our streams look like this. you know there's not good vegetation around them. They may be channelized or incised. And then beavers, will move in and um, create this complexity and um, increase the water table and create a, a more re restored stream. 
Um, so uh, we, they're our restoration partners. So we want to keep them there as much as we can. Um, and we also may try to mimic them sometimes or encourage them to come, come to our restoration sites through something called a beaver dam analog. Um, that is just one way we try to pretend to be beavers, but really beavers can do it all themselves as long as we give them the right um, food and the right, um, and let them be. Honestly, they do okay everywhere as long as we we let them let them be. Um, yeah, so are there any questions before I move on to beaver management? Um, that was kind of most of the benefits I wanted to um, we've got one question that might actually kind of like segue into beaver management. Right. It's um it's a going back to like fish habitat stuff. Somebody asked, my question is about beaver dams and salmon in very urban areas where there are not any side channels for fish to move upstream. This happens in our area where the channel sides have been armored and the dams are a barrier to fish. Salmon migrating upstream in the fall is our issue. Any advice for this situation? So Sounds like, yeah, they're in like a super urban area trying to build. Totally. Yeah, yes, I've run into this question before. I've had many landowners kind of reach out and say, hey, I'm, you know, this dam is huge. Uh, there's no way fish can get past this. Um, and that could, can be true in modified environments like the one you're talking about, um, really urban environments where the stream is not acting naturally. There's no side passages. Um, or stuff like that. Um, and a lot of times I've talked to our fish and wildlife biologists and they are also not super concerned about these instances. Um, and that is because, uh, again, fish are moving when it is right for them to move. So water is gonna be higher a lot of the times and fish can, can have learned to jump over the dams. Um, there are instances, there's one one project I'm going to do this winter where um, it's a highly modified armored stream channel and we are going to put a notch in that dam to provide better fish passage. So we're going to lower that dam. Um, we're still coexisting with the beavers because they're still providing great water quality habitat benefits um, and retaining um, soil, but uh, sediment through the water column. Um, we're, but we're just going to make it a little easier for fish to jump by jump through by lowering it just a little bit and putting um, a fish passable fence, which we'll talk about here in a sec. Okay, and then we, we actually just got another question that also probably will, I assume you might talk about this. They said, has the Snohomish Conservation District built any beaver dam analogs? How frequently has this been done? Yes, uh, we have a couple, we have one main project with beaver dam analogs. Uh, we've actually installed something called a post-assisted log structure, which is very similar to beaver dam analogs. Um, it's just not channel spanning. Um, and we did that because it was a very incised stream that had limited uh, woody vegetation in it. So we added that large woody debris and um, created something called a bank blaster. So we um, did beaver dam analogs or post-assisted log structure, sorry, and um, kind of directed water to the side of the stream channel to actually try to erode it so that water can move up and over onto that floodplain and create different side channels and um, interact with its community a little more. Um, we also did that to encourage beavers um, to come and build their, you know, a high velocity and sized deep uh, stream can be difficult for beavers to start building on and we're like hey this is here's some here's a head start uh give it a try um and i know uh organizations like beavers northwest also use beaver dam analogs or post assisted log structures to encourage beavers to build somewhere that they're not already building so um in one instance a uh, beaver was building up against a culvert and um that was not you know, we don't want that. We don't want debris going through our culverts. We want to protect that culvert. So we, they put a beaver dam analog um, just upstream of it and said, hey, beavers, don't build there, build over here. Um, so that is also another technique um, that um, is used in restoration 
I hope to do more Beaver Dam analogs. Um, and it is definitely definitely kind of part of the restoration technique. Um, it's something called low low process, low, low tech process-based restoration. So we're really looking at the processes of the stream and trying to to reset them. So we're putting that large wood back into it and increasing um the chance of beavers coming in. Um yeah. I hope that answers the question. Cool. Uh yeah. Let's talk about beaver management. Um obviously uh you may be interested because beavers are flooding your property right now. Um despite all of their great benefits, they still cause a lot of issues for the infrastructure that humans have built our roads, our houses, um, our property. Um, so there are kind of three beaver conflicts that I want to focus on. Um, tree chew, culvert blockage, and just general flooding. Um, and before we get too scared of these conflicts, um, I just want to say there are solutions that I'm going to cover. And um, if you are experiencing beaver conflicts, uh, I encourage you to reach out and we can work together to find a solution. So one of the one of the um, solutions that people turn to is beaver trapping. Um, you it is legal to trap and kill beavers. Um, the live traps have to be used. Um, as a landowner, you are allowed to do that. You're you're allowed to take nuisance beavers and kill them. Um, you're also allowed to hire a professional trapper to kill them. Um, there's also relocation. So the Tulela Beaver Project specifically um, traps nuisance beavers, but then they also relocate them and move them to a place that could use them. So a lot of times they move them to hydro hydraulically impaired tributaries in the upper Snohomish watershed for better fish rearing habitat or better uh, water storage. Um, relocation is a really cool technique um, that is used not only to save these nuisance beavers, but also uh, restore areas. Um, unfortunately, um, or yeah, unfortunately, um, trapping and relocation are both temporary. Like we talked about, um, beavers are continuously having new kits every year, and every two years, those kits will move out and disperse and try to find their own habitat. So if one beaver thought it was a good habitat, another beaver is likely to move in later and say, hey, this is a good habitat. I'm going to build here again. Um, so these solutions, trapping, relocation, are really temporary and short term. Um, like I just talked about uh, with that one question, um, rest if a beaver has built in an incorrect place, but there's room somewhere else for them to be, um, you can oftentimes deter them, remove their dam with a permit um, from that undesired location, and then encourage them to build somewhere else. So installing those beaver dam analogs and post-assisted log structures, and then also increasing their food. So planting their planting willows maybe that they love um, and encourage them to establish somewhere else. Um, that is something that I am also very interested in pursuing more at the district, um, just allowing beavers, giving beavers better places to build. Um, and then uh, just going back to longer term solutions um, for tree chew, you know, like we talked about beavers eat herbaceous, uh, eat wetting material, and then they also use it to build their dams and lodges. So um, they'll cut down a lot of trees and um, they, which can cause hazard trees. And then also, you know, people don't wanna see all their trees gone. Um, trees are great. Um, so this is definitely a conflict I see a lot. Um, thankfully, it is one of the easiest conflicts to, um, to prevent. Um, tree caging is pretty effective as long as you do it cor correctly. Um, you want a tree cage that is pretty tall, as you can see here. I mean, this is not totally to scale, but roughly. Um, beavers are pretty big. You know, they can be up to 70 pounds. Um, so we want to make sure that fencing is, is four feet tall is what I recommend. Um, and then um, making sure that that 
fencing is secured in the ground with some wood posts or some metal posts. Um, so beavers can't uh, move it themselves. They're very persistent and they're very smart. So um, you want to make sure that fence is secure. I also like leaving a gap between the tree and the cage, um, the fencing. And that is one to prevent the beavers from just chewing through the mesh size of the fence. And then it's also so that tree can grow happily without it being impeded by that fence. Um, this is really effective. Um, I also like to call beavers lazy. Um, they're not, I would they're not really lazy, but um, they are gonna go for the easiest, easiest source. So uh, if you put a cage around it, even if it's not like the most secure, they may not want to go after it. Um, for culvert blockages, um, beavers love culverts because um, it's it's already a constriction of flow. They're always looking for that constriction of flow where it's going to be easiest to build a dam. So uh, culverts are one of those places you are already shoving an entire stream into a pipe. Um, so um, they oftentimes will block it just like in that lower video or <laughs> lower picture or even that top video just create a dam within the culvert. This is something we want to prevent because um, we're again we're modifying that environment and we're creating fish passage barriers. So if a, if a beaver were to come in and block a culvert 100% or even make it so difficult that a, beaver, a fish can't jump up through it, um, that is a fish passage barrier um, that we want to address. Um, if a beaver were to build a dam, again, in a normal stream system, unmodified, um, uh, again, a salmon might be able to use side passages or jump easier. But in these culverts, we want to uh, prevent blockages. Also, culverts are obviously an important um, infrastructure that allow us humans to um, drive across or access different things. Um, very important safety-wise as well. But there is a solution, <laughs> again, um, something called a culvert exclusion fence. Um, so you clear the dam. Um, we don't want, we, you know, a lot of times we can't, we don't want any dam material near that culvert. Um, sometimes it's not providing very good habitat for the beaver anyway, um, or we encourage them to build somewhere else. Um, and then we put this fence in. Um, the fence is, I typically use handy, handy pa panels, um, which have a fish passable mesh size. So fish and wildlife, if any of these in-stream um, in stream flow devices require a permit from Fish and Wildlife, and they always require it, uh, it on stream fish streams that it be fish passable. So those, um, the mesh size of that fence is, is going to allow a fish through it, but hopefully not a beaver. Um, and these work pretty well. Um, again, beavers are going to try to work wherever is easiest. So we're making it more difficult by increasing the surface area they would have to dam up, uh, making it really wide and really long. Um, so uh, beavers typically will either leave them alone or will try to build through it and give up eventually because it's just too big for them to manage. Um, so that's called a culvert exclusion fence. There's a picture of a couple of them. Um, and again, pretty pretty nice way to protect your infrastructure, protect your culvert, and allow fish passage. So the last conflict can be the most impactful. Uh, just general flooding. That beaver dam is going to raise the water and uh, cause places to flood that typically don't flood. Um, the solution to this is uh, flow devices. So um, pictured here is something called a pond leveler. And that is uh, kind of the historically accepted and um, efficient solution to um, reducing water levels of a beaver dam. Unfortunately, um, there are some questions raised about if this is actually fish passable. Um, currently, Fish and Wildlife does not typically permit these. So um, we had to kind of um, invent a new way. Um, that new way is called a notch exclusion fence. So um, you notch the dam as much as, as little as you 
as little as possible. So we want to keep the dams there, or the dams and the beavers there for the great benefits they provide that we covered. Um, so, but we also want to prevent that flooding that's happening to our infrastructure, um, to to the safety of our communities. Um, so we just lower it enough to prevent that risk to infrastructure and then put a weird fence in that little notch. Um, that looks like looks like that picture. And here's kind of a, a design view of it. Um, so we do that notch. We exclude the beavers from that with our fencing. And then we also um, tear it on the downstream end so that fish are able to jump up uh, have a nice pool inside that fencing and then jump up over the dam. Um, so we're kind of addressing both concerns there, flooding and fish passage, um, which is that one project I'm going to do this winter. Um, we'll kind of do this in a place where we're not too concerned about flooding, but we are concerned about fish passage. Um, just kind of to summarize, uh, if beavers are in a problematic location, um, we can do restoration and beaver dam analogs. They're chewing down your trees and creating hazards. There's tree wrapping, uh, culvert blockages has exclusion fencing, and then uh, flooding can be minimized by uh, flow devices, specifically that notch exclusion fence. Um, Stonebridge Conservation District can provide all of that, provide technical assistance on all of that, um, and cost share in some cases. So that's financial assistance. Um, we serve all of Snohomish County and then also Camino Island. Um, if you have a beaver problem in this, in those areas, please reach out. We're happy to provide technical assistance and see what else we can do for you to help um, connect you to some other organizations if needed. Um, right now we have funding in these priority areas, um, the Pilchuck River, French Creek, Woods Creek, and lower Skycomish watersheds. If you are in these watersheds, uh, we have funding available to fund um, beaver coexistence projects. Um, you would still have to go through a ranking process, but we have money that we're looking to spend on beaver coexistence um, in these areas. Um, yeah, beavers are throughout Snohomish County. Um, this is a kind of a snapshot of iNaturalist of where people have reported beavers. Again, they're kind of everywhere. If there's water and wood, they probably will be there. Um, populations are increasing um, after they were almost extirpated in the 1800s. Um, so more conflicts are also arising with more beavers dispersing. Um, again, the district can help uh, we will provide site visits to assess your dams or uh, beaver conflict. Uh, we can walk you through the permitting process of um, putting in a flow device. Uh, we can oh, oftentimes, if we have funding available, we can even provide the materials and do the installation of those flow devices. Um, plus, like Laura talked about, we do a lot more. So I always encourage you to reach out and we can um, provide some assistance for your natural resources and conservation and just your goals of your property in general. Uh, just wanna touch, touch on some other great resources, um, which I think Laura will include in some of the follow-up email. Um, King County have a great website with some papers on beavers. They're a little dense, uh, but they're, they're very well written and put together. Um, I, I refer to them a lot. Um, Better Ground um, has a fact sheet about beavers, kind of summarizing a lot of what we talked about and then just referring people back to their district to um, coexist with beavers. Living with Wildlife um, through Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife also has a great beaver uh, webpage uh, with facts about beavers and then summarize some of the solutions I've talked about. Um, then if you really want to get deep into it, um, the Beaver Restoration Guidebook by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is a great resource um, that talks about working with beavers um, on properties, but also in restoration. Um, 
yeah, that's all I had. Um, thank you for listening. And I would love to answer any last questions. Um, I just want to give a special thanks to Elisa Kerr, who um, developed, initially developed this kind of presentation. I built off of it. And then, um, yeah. Thanks for Department of Ecology for funding this sort of work as well. Awesome. Thanks, Ariana. I definitely learned some things. It's funny because, you know, we work together and sometimes I don't even know what you're up to. So <laughs> it's cool to know that this is what you're out there doing. Yeah. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Uh, someone asked, have the Beaver Dam Analogs project projects been successful? So like, what's your success rate? Yeah, like I said, we didn't, haven't done too many of them um, and success is kind of hard to define. So really we're trying to increase complexity of these environments. And, you know, in that one specific case, we're trying to uh, decrease erosion and increase, increase degradation. So increasing uh, sediment retention and then also accessing that floodplain. Uh, we've had that installed at that project for about three years. I want to say, um, and yes, we've seen some success. Some of the the PALs are working. Um, they are kind of eroding and bank blasting those sides, and then they definitely are retaining sediment and also retaining some uh, debris that flows downstream and kind of creating a, a log jam per se. Um, beavers are definitely active at at that site. So far, I haven't noticed them building off of any of our um structures but um i haven't been out there this this winter so we'll have to see sweet um and then there was also a question are there restrictions on when and where you will move slash relocate beavers and i don't know if this implies that the district does that which we don't right right yes we do not uh relocate beavers or trap them um, definitely, there are a lot of regulations. Uh, Fish and Wildlife right now has a pilot program on beaver relocation. Um, you have to get certified through them in order to relocate them. You know, we really want to think when we're relocating beavers, we really want to think about where we're, we're relocating them since they have so much impact. They're, they're going to change that environment. Um, so we don't want to cause flooding concerns um, somewhere else. We don't want to put them in a place where beavers already are because they are territorial. Um, and we also wanna take care of our beavers while we are trapping them and relocating them, moving them to a new location. So Fish and Wildlife definitely uh, regulates that. Um, the Tulela Beaver Project is really the only, um, one of the only organizations that is certified in Western Washington. Okay, yeah, that was gonna be my next question is like, if people are interested, who should they, contact if they're interested yeah. in relocation. if you're interested in relocation um i encourage you to reach out to me first uh coexistence is the you know the main goal um trapping and relocating is going to be short term and a lot of times um Tulay the Tulay beaver project will recommend coexistence first so try that out see if it'll work see if we can just keep these beavers there um if it doesn't work they can come out later and evaluate for relocation. So yeah, Tulela Beaver, me first, <laughs> I would say, or um, coexistence first. And then uh, the Tulela Beaver Project is um, the place that relocates. Uh, they are, they have a limited relocation window and are oftentimes uh, booked up pretty quickly. Um, but again, coexistence is kind of that first step. Awesome. Um, and then we've got, we had a, a couple questions in the Eventbrite uh, registration yeah. form about beaver deceivers. Yeah. I don't know much about that. So somebody said, can you talk about beaver deceivers? I'm not sure what they are or if they're helpful, stuff like that. Yeah. So beaver deceiver, that term was kind of coined on the East Coast um, and it was a uh, it's technically these culvert exclusion. I'll see if I can get to it. Uh, these culvert exclusion fences is technically a beaver deceiver. Um, these pond levelers are another thing that people like to call beaver deceivers. Um, really, I think what that person is trying to get out or get at, or the the real meaning behind beaver deceivers are these flow devices. Um, these things that we're putting in 
the stream on dams or where dams shouldn't be. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I think that they are useful in cases where infrastructure, um, health and safety are at risk. Um, you know, with the notch exclusion fences, we are keeping as much habitat for the beaver as we can. You know, we're coexisting with them. Um, we're not removing that entire dam or killing them, taking them off the landscape. Um, and with with maintenance and monitoring, they work pretty well. Um, they do require that maintenance and monitoring. Otherwise, they will easily fail. Again, beavers are really smart and uh, really tenacious. So they're going to try to defeat your device. Um, but as long as you monitor and maintain it and adaptively manage, um, they're pretty effective. Um, again, they are permitted by Fish and Wildlife, so they shouldn't have any uh, fish passage concerns. All right, I think that that's most of the questions, but if you guys end up having any more questions, um, feel free to email either of us. I'll be sending an email to all of you with this recording and we'll post this on YouTube as well. And uh, you can also always uh, reach out to us at um, outreach at snohomishcd.org or dot, dot org. Yeah, <laughs> I think outreach yeah, at org, Snohomish yeah. CD. Yeah, I'll include it in all the follow up stuff. Sure, I have it too on my edge. Okay, awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, yeah, you can email right there. Yeah, sorry. So yeah, thank you guys so much for coming and please do stay in touch. If you're interested, I'll send a link to sign up for our newsletter where we post all of our events and um, you can go to our events calendar and see what we've got. The next thing that we've got coming up, which I think is our, oh, it's actually next year <laughs> in January. Uh, I say oh, it's the last event of the year, but it'll be part of the new year. So on January 20th, we'll do another similar presentation at the Lake Stevens Library, but we'll get to go see one of these projects that Ariana has been working on. So yeah, really excited for that. Um, we'd love to see you there. And thanks for thanks for coming, everybody. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone.